Welcome to another episode of the Convene podcast. This is a Convene talk, an overview of the most interesting from our popular newsletter, News Junkie. My name is Magdalena Tanasova, Digital Media Editor at Convene. Barbara, let's kick it off. Hi, yes, I'm Barbara. I'm Deputy Editor at Convene. I was so excited to see this story in the news lineup. It was in Fast Company, and it's a story about a Yale lab led by Joy Hirsch and their findings about why Zoom makes your brain go numb. I write the meetings in your brain column for Convene. There's a wonderful author, Annie Murphy Paul. She wrote a book called The Extended Mind. And she has written about this, about the fact that our brains have been studying in, in isolation. And I I'm really want to tell this story because I think it's one of the most fascinating stories about kind of science and what and how we learn and what we learn. So one of the reasons our brains, we know so much about singular brains, is because the machines that they use to measure brain waves, only one person fit in. And so this researcher, Joy Hirsch, her lab figured out a way to look at two brains together. And they discovered all kinds of things. And one of the things is that we learn differently when we're together. There's different areas of our brain. And one of the big takeaways is that the things that we learn socially stick. We remember them more accurately and for longer if we learn them with people. And I think that that's something that we kind of intuitively know, that there's so much emotional information when we're together. I think this just opens up an incredible area of rethinking all kinds of things. I just had a thought when you were talking about this really good evidence of that is, you know, I've heard a lot from my friends who work in the education system. I've also read some stories about this, about how a lot of kids are really behind because of the pandemic, because they weren't around each other learning and, you know, having to learn from home over Zoom really put them kind of at a disadvantage. And a lot of them are behind now in certain areas. So I think that's proof of exactly what you're saying. I also just found this research interesting because for listeners at home, this is Casey Gao, Managing Editor of Convene. We are a fully remote team and have been even pre-pandemic. So we're very accustomed to uh, working remotely, speaking over Zoom and Teams and video systems like that. And it is an entirely different way of working and processing information and collaborating than what we're used to in person. And I think especially for those who aren't used to it long-term, it, it's a real adjustment and really takes a different parts of your brain to be able to still connect emotionally and collaborate with your colleagues remotely versus in person. Yeah, and it just has such implications for meetings. Mm -hmm. What I think is like Zoom is better than nothing. You know, if you're a medical association and you're teaching a life-saving technique, video and Zoom is, you don't want to not use that. But for what I think of as like production of knowledge, new ideas, innovations, I think those kind of things are brains working together in proximity to each other is a, is a real advantage. It's also why moving forward, hybrid meetings are so important because we have to acknowledge that video gives us accessibility either physically or monetarily that some people cannot access in person. So that's great. It opens up more people to more avenues of knowledge, but also having that in-person component for those who are interested and who those, those are able to collaborate in person. Hi, it's Michelle Russell, Editor-in-Chief. I think I can cope with Zoom calls, except when they're excessive. I think there's such a thing as Zoom fatigue. I notice if I have three or more of these video calls a day, I just feel like I'm really just spent. 
it requires a kind of focus where you're just really looking at everybody on the screen. And also you're seeing yourself, which is just disconcerting. You don't see yourself when you're just talking face to face with other people. I know some people hide themselves. I haven't figured out how to do that, but it's like a collective fatigue. It just as the day goes on, if you have more than a few of these meetings. Yeah, that's Kurt Wagner, digital editor. I also feel like if you're in meetings with people you know, like Zoom meetings with people you know better, it's not as difficult to sort of relate and to go back and forth and pick things up if you want to learn things as it is if you're new or if you in a group that you've not dealt with or if the group is huge. Our group is really manageable. And I would also say that when I first started at Convene, it was more difficult because nobody knew me and I didn't know anybody until we met in person. And then it became less stressful or less, there was less of a barrier, I think. I think that helps too. It's interesting. I chose a story about whether associations or anyone conventions should boycott or not, should boycott places that, in this case, the story is about places that have anti-LGBTQ bills in the works, because apparently right now state legislatures have 735 anti-LGBTQ bills in the works in the U.S. You know, this is becoming a, a big issue. I mean, not that it wasn't for, but so the story goes into how this organization has created this comprehensive guide banning the boycott, how to do business in times of discrimination. The organization is called the Global Diversity Alliance. And it brings together diverse voices related to diversity, equity, and inclusion globally. But the report sort of talks about how it's better not to do a boycott because you can maybe affect change or your organization can affect change in the place, which is something we've written about before. And there are a lot of other programs. Michelle, you wrote about Social Offset, which is the organization where they find ways if you want to do like a carbon offset would work. These would be social offsets where you could donate money to something in that state or a place like that. That's sort of what this whole story gets into and how this organization is working to do that. They have some tips how to go about doing it and how to sort of engage the local community and the local lesbian, gay, and bisexual, et cetera, community and possibly write things into your DEI criteria and benchmarks into your RFP, you know, do local work as this guy who's the president of this, I think, says, convene with intent. So I like this, but I do have to say my knee-jerk reaction always is, I would never go to that place. <laughs> and so it takes a lot of rethinking, I think, to figure this out, to just take a step back and think about it a little bit. Although there are still some places I would never go because I would be arrested. So I won't be going there. Yeah, I really love the idea of social offset. I think we know that events have the capacity to really leave a legacy behind at anywhere they bring their events. And I think that's actually the boldest choice that an organization can make is to actually go to the destination and face the issues that they have head on and try to influence positive change instead of just avoiding the destination altogether. I think we know by now that the frontline workers are really the people who suffer the most when events avoid certain destinations because of their policies. So I love the idea of actually going to the destination and saying, no, we're not okay with these laws, but here's what we're doing to help make a change and support the people who are being targeted. On that note, I would like to thank you all for this conversation. And I hope everyone listening enjoyed our discussion on some of the most interesting stories that we curated in News Junkie. Here's your reminder to also subscribe not only to the podcast, but to our newsletters so that you can keep up with the latest from the Convenience team. Until next time.